So hi everyone and welcome back to the channel. Now this little video is going to be about disc brake rotor design for road bikes and why I'm not using the Shimano disc rotors anymore. As you can see behind me I've got Campagnolo AFS rotors on my road bike. I've had two sets of the Shimano rotors. One was a Dura Ace uh, front and rear and then I tried XTR front and rear and both of them I just can't get to last beyond about six months. Now to replace the set costs about 100 quid so that's 200 quid a year just replacing these and I believe that the Icetech uh, aluminium sandwich construction is probably not the best solution and that's led me to choose something else and yes the Campy rotors do fit on Ultegra calipers they're 160mm same kind of thickness so they do fit straight on. So why do I not like the Icetech uh, Shimano design? Well firmly it's a really nice design because you've got this large uh, aluminium core which goes right to the edge of the disc and either side of that you've got sandwiched in a well making that sandwich you've got a stainless steel laminate which is kind of fused either side now that stainless steel panel either side is very thin but it only needs to be there for the braking surface and the majority of the thickness is aluminium which actually acts as the heat sink and then it passes the heat to these fins because it's all part of the same construction and the fins are designed to lose the heat to the air now a minimum amount of heat is designed to go into the spider through the pin joints so you're keeping the heat away from the hub, keeping the heat away from the bearings. In this kind of design, the heat is designed to be lost through the fins before it really gets to the spider. It's got a floating rotor design. It's pinned on these on these four rivets, and that goes for the campy ones as well. But I believe, firmly, these are, these are probably good. But the thing I don't like about these is they just don't last, and they're very easily knocked out of true because the aluminium sandwich core is probably about two-thirds of the whole thickness. It's not very stiff. And even just getting these in and out of the car, uh, putting them into the bike, if you knock it on the caliper, if you knock it on the car door or something, it's very easy to put these out true. And they're just not that repeatable. And I also think there's uh, some kind of thermal hysteresis repeatability issues with these as well. Because they're not very inherently stiff in the actual braking surface or the rotor uh, sandwich construction, is that when the brakes thermal through the heat cycle uh, and get hot and cold, hot and cold, the mountain, mounting conditions on the pins on the spider changes. Now, if those mounting conditions change uh, like ununiformly when they expand and contract, the, the disc rotor can actually go slightly out of true. Now, the spider is there for a reason. It's to allow the uh, braking surface to sort of float somewhat so it can conform to the parallelism of the caliper and of the pads and it allows it a bit of um, a little bit of float when it gets hot and it expands and contracts and that's pretty much common all over all types of you know motorsport or automotive uh, braking rotor design is that the rotor will actually float a little bit on the hub and is either bolted or pinned to allow some kind of little bit of compliance there in terms of thermal cycling and also parallelism conformity to the caliper but in road bikes, I think that's probably not the best solution because we're working with such fine clearances between the pads and the disc, that floating rotor design, I think, gives more problems than it actually benefits you. So um, any kind of ununiformity in the way that these pinned conditions work when the thing gets hot and cold uh, can lead to a slightly bent rotor. And people refer to as um, warped rotors. Well, actually... What, it's kind of, that's kind of a misleading term because the rotor itself, its material, doesn't really change its crystalline structure. It doesn't actually warp. It's more often than not the, the actual pinned conditions are slightly changing. And if you get a rotor really, really hot and then you come to the stop at the bottom of the hill, you can also hear these things ticking. And that is the uh, expansion and contraction of the braking surface and the uh, hysteresis in the rivets, uh, slightly making a ticking noise. And that can lead to a slightly warped rotor. And that's the most annoying thing is after you finish your descent, uh, that was perfectly true at the top and when you get to the bottom you let the brakes off and even when things cooled down and the fluids cooled down and the pistons have come back out to where they started is that that will now be ticking and I just can't stand that and it doesn't lose you many watts if you pick up the front wheel and spin it it's hardly any resistance it's more just a pain in the ass to listen to the person sat behind you on the group ride doesn't want to listen to this rubbing all day and it's just a pain the other thing I've got against the Shimano brakes is that like I said at the start they just don't seem to last long enough and this one uh, is pretty much on the wear limit. I've measured it, it's 1.5 mil, but the steel braking surface is actually delaminated from the aluminium core, and I'll show you some pictures of that, some close-ups of that. That is pretty dangerous. That could very quickly just wreck itself, 
Uh, it's delaminated, it's bubbled up, it's come unbonded from the aluminium core and it's actually cracked in a number of places where the vents in the outer braking surface are at their thinnest or their narrowest uh, position. Um, so durability wise, I just don't rate these. And yes, they might be the best thermally, but actually I don't see many complaints about these or other kind of solid steel construction like six volt rotors being, you know, not good thermally. Um, but the main design ethos of this is to lose the heat at the braking surface or near to the braking surface before the heat goes into the spider and into the hub. Because actually what you want to do, what you really don't want to do is put a lot of heat into the hub shell. And you know, things without an aluminium spider or, or these riveted joints can do that. And if you pass a lot of heat directly into the hub shell, that's really bad for your bearing life because it ruins the grease. The grease goes runny and can run out the seals. And at worst case, let's say this is getting 300 degrees on the, on the braking surface. If you've then got 250 degrees, let's say, in, in, the, out, in the outside of the hub shell, uh, worst case, you're going to lose your press fit um, tolerance on the outer race of the, of the wheel bearings, basically. And if the wheel bearings become loose in their seats, then you've ruined your hub, you've ruined the bearings, and you're probably going to ruin the axle as well. So you really don't want to pass too much heat into the hub. So you have to be careful if you're not using this pinned joint, because if you're talking about thermal pathways, if, if you want to stop you know, thermal flow going through to something, you, you neck the area and you provide it a very small surface contact. So thing, so brake rotors with the aluminium spider, which are rifted on, are quite good at keeping the heat to the outside um, because it's hard for the heat to flow down through that next portion into the spider. Any heat that does get put in the spider in the aluminium section, in these Shimano ones, is then tried to lose from the spider um, because it's got very large surface area and quite high thermal mass. So if you're going to make something without spider, um, you need to do a bit of thermal simulation to make sure that heat doesn't flow down into the hub before it can be lost to the air. So you've got to take that into account. But I don't see too many problems with um, actually just having the, the whole braking surface of steel because it's inherently stiffer. Uh, it's going to have less kind of mechanical hysteresis on the rivets when it gets hot and cold and you thermally cycle it. And I just think it's going to be more resilient. It's going to be more resilient to knocks when you're getting it in and out of the car. It's going to be more resilient to knocks when you're installing it into the caliper. And how many times do you see on TV in the pro peloton where you know some guy gets a puncture, um, they whip the wheel out, and the, the dude rushes out of the car, bangs the wheels on the car door, bangs the wheels on the dropouts of the fork when he's trying to shove it in quickly, and then five minutes later you see the same rider stop, com complain that he's got a rubbing rotor. And I just think the Shimano ones, they just aren't very sturdy. Um, thermally, they're probably the best at losing the heat to the air because of the sandwich construction of the aluminium. But I think durability wise, they're just not the best and not the most repeatable. So I've gone for the steel ones to try them out. I've still got the riveted joint. I can't do anything about that because you can't actually buy uh, center lock steel rotors without this riveted spider. But that's where the peak torque disc brake design comes in. I'm actually designing my own disc brakes and I'm going to make a center lock steel disc brake um, without the spider. So I'm going for a full steel construction down to the center lock interface. Um, and I'm going to try that out. Now, this is going to be a, a thing I'm going to feature on the channel in the next couple of months. If you're interested in getting on board and, and you know having a set, then do let me know. Give, give me an email, write a comment down below. But um, I'm going to try and do away with the floating rotor design because I think, in theory, it works. And it works in motorsport, it works in cars, and it works in yeah supercars and stuff. But they've got a lot more pad clearance. In road bike calipers, we really don't have a lot of clearance to play with. So I think the floating rotor and riveted joints give more problems than the, than the benefits they gain. Um, so I'm going to go for a solid steel construction down to the sense lock inf interface. Now now I've got these off, I can kind of reverse engineer the spline because sh obviously Shimano don't put the spline standard online for me to look at and to put on my technical drawing. So I actually, actually measure that up with some QC tools to find out the exact dimension of, this, dimension of the spline. Um, if anyone knows that technical info, please do let me know so I can stick it straight into the CAD. But it's going to be a bit of a weight penalty on the Shimano ones or anything with an aluminium spider because I'm going for steel construction all the way around and I have to make the spline interface in steel as well, which is going to be a fair chunk of material. Now I've got a weight target in mind of around 150 grams, but the weight is my lowest priority on this. I'm going for repeatability, durability and also the thermal, the thermal properties of it. And then the weight is what it is. Uh, that's just like the last, the last in the priority list. So if you're interested, um, let me know and we'll get this design underway. I've already kind of drawn the envelope. I've already drawn a couple of different vented solutions. I just need to run the thermal sim and also finish off the spline interface uh, part of the drawing. Now, 
Most disc brakes, uh, if you're aware, are made out of 420 stainless steel. Now, most stainless steels are pretty cheesy soft, so you can't make out a 304 or 316, which are very good at being stainless. Um, so they use a 420 stainless steel, which in terms of being stainless isn't actually very good, it's quite easy to tarnish, but it's actually quite hard for stainless steel. So 420 stainless steel is quite a nice material to make you know, a, bicycle, a bicycle disc brake out of. Uh, but I actually think there's better materials out there and I'm speaking to a metallurgist who contacted me through the channel, was a viewer of the channel, um, and we're discussing some different materials to make brakes from. Now, I'll give you a hint of my material of choice. Um, it's not stainless, so overnight, yeah, you might get a few spots of rust come from dampness in the air on the brake surface, but you see that in cars, no one really cares. The first application of the brakes, it disappears. Um, we can coat the kind of center portion of the, the rotor design in, in a paint or a coating which will stop the rust there and then the rust will only appear or the tarnishing will only appear on the brake track. I'm not really bothered about that but I think there are better materials out there to make rotors from than 420 stainless. Um, so it's not going to be a stainless but it's going to be a very hard uh, other type of steel. I'd much rather replace the brake pads than the discs so often because these lasting six months is not really good enough. Even if they last a year that's a win for me um, and it's just quite a cool little fun project to do to see if I can make my own that can outperform these. Um, like I said, I just need to do the spline interface and do the thermal model uh, and make sure I'm not transferring too much heat into the hub because that's pretty catastrophic. So if you're interested in this project, let me know. Uh, I think it'd be a bit fun. But yeah, that's a little discussion about um, disc brake design, construction, and why I don't believe these things. I mean, if you're a pro team and you can afford to replace these every couple of months, then I think these are probably the best. They're very, they're very, very light and they probably do the best job of, of thermal managing. Um, you really don't want to pass too much heat back into the caliper, back into the pads, and back into the fluid. And especially uh, if you've got air in the fluid, if you can't lose the heat from the rotor and you're passing heat back into uh, the pads every time it makes contact, um, the fluid's going to expand. If they're not bled properly, you're going to get less clearance as the pistons come in. So the thermal management of uh, how much heat you keep here, how much heat you I mean, you can pass some heat into the hub and use the hub as a heat sink. As long as you don't pass like 300 degrees to the hub, uh, melt the grease and lose the bearing fit, um, that, you know, that's an issue. But it's all a balance between how much heat you keep at the brake track, how much heat you can pass into the spider, and how much heat you can tolerate in the hub. If you can't tolerate much heat in the hub, you have to keep it outside here and try and lose it to the air. Um, if you keep this too hot, then you pass it back into the caliper. The caliper gets hot, the fluid gets hot, and the pistons come in. So it's a very tricky balance on you know, the thermal path of all this heat. Um, adding mass is gonna help. Adding thermal mass is gonna help. Adding surface area will help. So the weight target of mine being lowest priority kind of helps on those two things anyway. So um, yeah, in the next couple of videos, maybe I'll share with you some designs and we'll see if anyone's interested. But hope you enjoyed that, uh, I'm gonna try these Campy discs out but so far after bedding them in, they work absolutely fine. Uh, they've still got the floating rotor design, which I don't quite like. I prefer just a solid construction. I've never really had any problems with solid construction six bolt rotors. Um, I don't believe the floating rotor design works too well uh, for bikes. And it's the same, and it's the same with the mountain bike. Um, these are quite basic uh, ice tech. XT style rotors, I think these are XT. And again, although it doesn't look like it and they don't have the big extra fins, most of the material of that thickness of the disc brake is aluminium. So cheers and see you in the next one.